Joel, I'm so excited to be back on the podcast with you today. Sometimes we glean questions from YouTube, or I know you do a Theology Talk Tuesday, sometimes yep. we get some questions from there. Um, today's kind of started with, I feel like you and I, like we have this question and we need yeah, to figure this out. For sure. Um, so before we really get into the question, I'm going to tell you, a com- I'm going to confess something to you. Oh. I absolutely hate being bad at things. <laughs> I, this may be stating the obvious, but I don't know. I don't think, I don't know if everybody thinks this way. Like if I start to feel like an activity or a game or I mean really anything could be could be something that I would not excel at I really don't want to do it Mm -hmm. and it's not because I'm afraid of looking bad at it in front of other people it's like I can't bear the weight of my own embarrassment so like I wait so that wait hold on (laughs) I'm hold up wait a minute I'm more competitive with myself than I really am I'm like I'm not really worried about being competitive with you, I'm competitive against myself. Okay, so if I, I like thing, if though. I feel, yeah, it's just different. If I feel like you're going to be bad at this, uh-huh. I'd rather just like not try at all. But because why? Because I don't want to seem incompetent or oh. weak or that I can't do something. Um, so it's not so much about the failure, but about the perception of what mm. the failure does like how that I think it would be like if I fail then that means I wasn't capable of doing something yep Mm -hmm. but I don't again it's not really the perception because I'm not really worried about like what other people think of me but it's like what I'll think of myself oh that I fell short see I worry about what other people think of me oh I feel like that's harder (laughs) well thanks (laughs) no I just (laughs) appreciate that no I just feel like that like I mean what's going on in my brain could sometimes be crazy town but to Uh. have thoughts going on about yourself and then to have to think about well then what are other people thinking yeah for sure i'm not saying i don't struggle with what people think of me at all but i'm just kind of speaking more to like my wiring do you ever struggle with this always okay i mean just told you (laughs) (laughs) like i really care like i do i like i care about like what yeah kind of people think and Mm -hmm. um yeah um i think that so okay if you're gonna go confession i might as well go confession as well uh, probably my earliest memory as a kid. I think I was like four or five. You guys might not know this. I so I'm Indian. Did you know that? I, I did. You did. Know <laughs> thank, that. thank you for, for the reminder. Else, <laughs> for everybody else, like from India, and so I was born in the Chicagoland area, the greatest city of all time. Uh, Jordan, I watched. I grew up watching Jordan win the three peat, repeat the three peat. We had Chicago deep dish spots across, like you know, the street from us. You were just uh, thriving, thriving. Portillos, thriving. yeah. Chicago style hot dogs, y'all. Oh my gosh, it was so good. Um, but my mom and dad were working. They were young when they had me, and so. So they actually sent me when I was two years old, they sent me to India to live from the ages of two to four and a half. So kind of fascinating. My first language that I learned was not English. It was Telugu, which mm-hmm. is one of the major dialects in India. Um, I could comprehend and understand English decently because my grandparents, my aunts and uncles all said it to me and talked to me, but I did not know. So fast forward, I come back. Uh, my parents are like, hey, we need to put this kid in school. So I go to a private Christian elementary school. Um, which you think is like a safe place. Like, of course, like it's a Christian elementary school. These people love Jesus, right? These yeah, they tiny love Jesus. They're children. nice, right? They're yeah. nice, right? Right. So I walk in and I speak a, like not even a lick of English. Like I probably have my vocabulary is like six words, right? But high uh, comprehension. Like I understand when people are talking to me. And so I walk in and, and I'm like, oh, gosh, where do I sit? And there's like in the front row, there's the seat and I could recognize the four letters of my name, J-O-E-L. So I'm like, cool, that's where I'm supposed to sit. I won't ever forget, I'm walking in. I don't know if I'm supposed to have such clear memories of that this young, but I do. There was a bunny who is sitting in a plastic cage in the far left, just staring at me the entire time. And I'm thinking, I don't like bunnies. So I'm like walking in and I sit down and the class starts, you know? And all of a sudden, the teacher is like doing an icebreaker. Hey, do you like icebreakers? I hate them. It really depends. Well, M- usually no. So there's icebreaker. I get this icebreaker. They feel the, forced, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. And they can be traumatic. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm doing this icebreaker, and the teacher asks this question, hey, does anybody have any pets? Now, I've always been a dog person. I love dogs in India. There are stray dogs everywhere. I would just, you know, pick a dog and say, that's my dog. Like, that's my, my pet. My dog of the day. My yeah. dog of the day. Exactly. <laughs> I love, I'm a dog person. Yeah. 
So I understand what she's saying. And I'm like, I want to prove to these people, like, yo, like. I can hang. I can hang. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I raised my little brown hand up. And uh, the teacher looks at me and says, Joel, yes. Well, you know, uh, uh, what pet do you have? And I say, dog. Very confident. Dog. dog. <laughs> and I think I'm done. She had a follow-up question. Oh. You know what I hate, Shay? The follow-up follow question. Up question. <laughs> yeah. So then she goes, oh, what is your dog's name? At which point I am like, uh, I don't know how to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the, my vocabulary is pretty much dog, mom, dad, and pizza at this point, right? <laughs> so I just say with much less confidence, dog. At which point I start to hear the like snur like I don't know what do you call them snarky snarky comments, snarky and, comments laughs, yeah. and like the laughs and um and the entire time that bunny is staring at me <laughs> it won't stop staring and at me and you're like well thank God that bunny's not my pet and I'm like, I'm sweating you know yeah. and then finally she you, goes you do tend to do that when I you're, sweat when you're panicking oh yeah we did have a yeah we can tell that a different a different time different yeah. story so the teacher asks another like if. I don't know if this teacher is listening, but if you are listening, I believe in forgiveness or God is good and there's redemption and restoration. But I really hope in the future when a child is sweating in front of <laughs> profusely. you. Profusely. At a young age. At a young age. Get the child off the hook. Do not ask more questions. So the teacher, I think for her benefit is like, hey, <laughs> like, no, like. What's the dog's name? Like your she pet's thought you didn't name. understand. Yes, to which I go. Dog again, again, yo. The whole room is oh. erupting in laughter. I swear, this was the only time that Bunny stopped staring and started laughing at me. <laughs> like it was just to this day. I don't like bunnies. I just don't like them. And um, don't trust. This them. was like <laughs> so. This was actually a pretty actually formative moment in my life. Um, I laughed that day. So the story goes from here. I don't remember anything else from that day. Uh, my mom and my dad say, and my aunts and uncles, who my aunt lived actually with us at the time, they say that I came home crying and I said, I want to go back to India. I hate it here. And basically they said in about four weeks, I lost my Indian accent and I learned English. Mm. And I remember having this embedded emotive feeling I will never be the laughing stock of any situation ever again. Mm -hmm. Like I am always going to do whatever it takes to be the best, the smartest and kind of to your point and to your story. If I walk into a room and I don't, I'm like, I'm gonna walk straight out of that room. Like I won't even give them the opportunity, you know? And Shay, you know, what's so fascinating is that like fast forward all these years, I'm over here and I've earned these degrees and I've got, initials in front of my name and after my name and I'm still like struck with that moment mm -hmm. I get panicked if somebody asked me Joel what does John 3 16 say I'll be like Ugh. <laughs> uh uh oh wait I know that you know yeah yeah and there's a fear of being f like found out that I don't know that I'm weak that I'm vulnerable that you know, and so that has that was just like a, a massive fear moment in my life. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel I mean, it's so common to be to say or to hear like, well, no one's perfect. It's like we know that. But with our own, we are so uncomfortable with our own weaknesses. And so our weaknesses propel us to have a deeper fear of failure, of failing. Like, I don't want to be bad at things. I do not want to fail. I also think like in our culture like failure and um, anything less than success can be seen as like not an option. So there's right. like that pressure added to right. it. It's just, it's kind of like a whole mess. And whether it's something as serious of like kind of the situation that you gave where like you're giving an answer to something or, you know, whatever, um, like you're on a podcast or you're giving a teaching, you're like, what if I just black out and I forget yeah. what I'm supposed to say or I don't give the correct answer or it's something you know kind of more silly like my example like I don't like to play people's like token family game that I've never played before because what if I can't catch on and they're yeah. just like waiting for me to get with it but we we just create little um I guess coping mechanisms whether it's avoidance or overcompensating mm -hmm. to not have to fail so Joel when we're looking at
this question of like, why am I so afraid of failing? What do you think God would say to us? Or what does God's word tell us about how to not just identify our weaknesses or our fears, but to really move through them like yeah. you've taught. So I wanna I wanna get there. This was actually I spent I've spent the last and you know the Shay really well, the last eighteen months or a little bit longer, actually honestly my whole life of really trying to figure out um what happened to me in that moment of fear is everything became chaotic. <laughs> and the chaos turned into interior and exterior dysfunction in my relationships in the way that I viewed life, in the way that I viewed success, in the way that I viewed Yourself. Like, like every, you know, and you know what was absent in all of that? Peace. Like there, like I've just felt restless and I felt like I knew in my mind I wanted to regain peace. Like I wanted to get to a place of stability. I wanted to get to a moment of just feeling like I don't have to work for my worth. And it was absent. Mm. It just kept eluding me. And so here's what I found out about fear. Fear will typically do one of two things. Fear is going to turn you inward or it's going to turn you outward. Mm. So what happened for me is that fear turned me actually inward. And so here's some of the um, the descriptions of what an inward life looks like with fear. You become self-obsessed. You try to control things. You You fight after hustle culture. The goal is totally about self-preservation by your own means. You begin to shut people out. You even shut down really good opportunities because you're afraid of what the outcome might be because you can't control it. But <laughs> throughout all of Scripture, what's actually hiding in plain sight for us in order to experience the peace that God desires for us, it's actually this gift that so many of us, I'm going to say it, everybody's going to have like a visceral reaction to it. They're going to be like, ooh, what, are you being serious? But it, it I'm, I am being serious and I'm going to try to show through the text like why. It's the gift of humility. The gift of humility actually helps us go inward of being self-obsessed to actually going outward where we are able to turn to God and become aware of our weakness, be aware of our fears, be aware of our inability, which actually leads us to the source of true strength, true stability, true peace. And so humility is a gift that actually helps us to embrace the strength and the power um, of Jesus himself. And so uh, the payoff for humility, if you're like, Joel, uh, I didn't ask for this. I'm trying to run, run out the room because I've only heard of humility in a negative context. Well, uh, maybe it's because the context that you've heard it in is not a biblical context. Right. But a biblical context of humility actually gives you self-awareness without falling into the vicious cycle of self-obsession. And so, Jay, this is what I've come to know. This is what I ended up writing throughout my writing process for uh, my forthcoming book, The Hidden Peace that humility is fundamentally an intimate awareness of the magnitude of our sin and the magnificence of God's grace. Mm, that's so good. I think, gosh, when I think about my own life, like not only do I hate being bad at things, but I've recently started learning just from like the community around me and the Christian leaders in front of me or people that I'm learning from how uncomfortable or easy it is for me to numb out from like my own sinful nature, you know, because mm -hmm. I would say like our weaknesses and our failures and all those things, it's evidence of living in a fallen world. And we try to like resist that. Mm -hmm. And so through that, I feel like I resist the fact that like I am still a sinner. Mm -hmm. Like I am, you know, and just that just because I'm walking with Jesus doesn't mean the like sin in me just like decreases. Like, are there absolutely things that I've triumphed over by the power of the Holy Spirit and overcome? Like, yes, but I'm more painfully aware of my sin the longer I walk with Jesus, not the other way around. Like I'm more aware of my deep need for him the longer that I walk with him. And that comes from being aware of my sin. And notice how that awareness and that and that it it did doesn't drive you so lack of humility without that it's actually going to drive you deeper into yourself mm -hmm. right but the presence of humility actually drives you into into presence with jesus like it actually gives you a way out right. of that overbearing feeling yeah i love how first timothy says this and um it's in first timothy 1 15 through 16 i feel like it just gives us like a great place to kind of go into this next portion but it says this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance 
Jesus, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus, might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in in him for eternal life. Mm, so good. Like, I just love how that, like, shows us. It's like an invitation that being aware of our sin and, like, delighting in our weaknesses is, like, the beginning of living our a beautiful full life with Jesus. So yeah. where do we go from here, Joel? Yeah, I think maybe one of the things that people are just wondering right now is um, this sounds good, but can this actually live? Good? Right. Right. And so one of the things, Shay, you've heard me say this before, is a theology that is unlivable is absolutely unhelpful. Mm -hmm. And so we're committed to a lived theology. And so notice what happened here in First Timothy 1, 15 through 16. Christ came into the world Christ in the incarnation enters humanity. He lives out. So the incarnation itself is actually an act of divine humility. That the technical term is Christ condescends. He leaves heaven, the perfection of heaven, and comes into the chaos of humanity and the world in order to bring res re reconciliation and restoration for you and I. And so uh, the power of humility in the incarnation is that what Jesus does for us is actually restores our relationship with God. And when we're restored in our relationship with God, you know what else is restored? Peace. Amen. Like when we are connected at the hip with Jesus, we walk a little bit straighter. We're able to process hurt a little bit better. Like like all of these things that we're fearful of, it's not that the fear dissipates, but Jesus gives us the strength to process through those fears and through those hurts in a way that we come to the other side and we actually are better. We actually regain our true humanity. Here are the three things that I have come to find that humility is for us. The first thing is that is that humility is a protection. You see, humility actually protects us from thinking too low of ourselves. Um, you may have heard the the famous phrase. Uh, it's actually attributed to C.S. Lewis. Um, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less often. Shay, very dangerous to disagree with C.S. Lewis. So I'm not going to do that. Right. But I am going to suggest that biblical theological humility actually doesn't start with us. Mm. It actually starts first and foremost with God. When we are actually aware of who God is, we can know who we are. And if we know who God is and now we know who we are, we can know how to rightly relate to other people. This is my most simple definition of humility, awareness of God, which creates awareness of ourselves, which helps us relate to other people. Well, why is this a protection? Because when we know who God is, we can know who we rightly are. Mm. If you read Genesis 1 and 2, I find it super fascinating that God creates everything that is good. There's all of these creation narratives, and there's a summary at the very end of each of one uh, of them, and just says it was good, it was good. It's almost this um, tactical note to let us know that there's nothing that God does that is not good. And then the crown jewel of creation, it was very good, is the creation of humanity, of Adam and Eve. Important detail here: before Adam and Eve are ever given vocation. Before God tells them, hey, by the way, you've got this work to do in Eden, to cultivate, to guard, to protect it. Before any of that, the first thing that God says over Adam and Eve, can you imagine you are coming to existence and the first things you see is the beauty of God's creation, the glory of it. And you look up and there's Yahweh himself. Right. And the first thing that Genesis 1 and 2 tells us that God, that God says is a blessing over humanity. It, why? Because they are made in the likeness and image of God. They are made with innate dignity and worth. Humility she protects us from thinking too low of ourselves. It reminds us who we are in Christ. It reminds us of the great value and inherent worth that we have because we're made in the likeness and image of God. Uh, and so it's a protection. The second thing that humility is, is a prevention. Humility prevents us from thinking too much of ourselves. Mm. So so it's polar opposites. One is a kind of um, self-dejection, self-loathing, ultimately a lack of self-worth. Humility is like, nah, ain't no time for that because you are made in the likeness and image of God. But humility is also a prevention. It prevents us from thinking too highly of ourselves. If we think too lowly of ourselves, people are going to walk all over us. And nobody said ever you know, today's a great day for people to just walk over me, right? right? Like, no, we that that is painful. 
So humility protects us from being walked over, but humility prevents us from thinking too high of ourselves in which when that happens, we are the ones walking over people. Right. And the reason why is because we're actually following not the spirit, but we're following pride. Here's what pride does for us, Shay. Pride promises us clarity, but is actually deceptive the entire way. Mm. So pride's like, hey, by the way, there's this massive mountain. It is beautiful. You should come up and, and take a look. So we're like, yeah, cool. Let's go on this mountain hike. And pride's leading you all. It's like, look, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it? And you're like, yeah, this is amazing. This is beautiful. Pride takes you to the very top of the cliff. It says, hey, peer out over the edge and see how, how beautiful everything is. And you're like, yeah, this is epic. And you peer over. And then pride pushes you off of that cliff into a pit of despair and dysfunction, ultimately to your utter destruction. What humility does for us is it's a guardrail. It prevents us from buying into the seductive allure of pride. And it reminds us of who we actually are in light of who God is. And and that's super important. The last one, so we've got protection, prevention. The last one is it's a preservation. Uh, humility keeps us uh, totally, deeply, intimately rooted in the life of Christ so that um, we can live out the beauty of our true humanity that God always intended for us, that Jesus actually ensured uh, to be possible by his life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Humility, in a really powerful way, it actually regains our true humanity. It helps us to live with vulnerability, but without being destroyed or self-obsessed. It finds power and strength and courage, not from within, but from outside, from Jesus. And so um, humility is is such an unexpected gift that God has given to us. Um, and that's where I think, you know, I've just found such great relief and comfort for my fears because of the power of humility. So the listener today that's, you know, hearing this conversation about humility and failure and, and how they intersect, what would be your encouragement to them for someone that is just crippled by fear or they they really struggle with perfectionism or you know doing things just right like the first time what would you say like another perspective is just encouragement that humility would be for them yeah i'll just remind us like in the beginning i shared ultimately fear of failure robs us of peace Mm -hmm. um putting on humility cultivating a life of humility is actually what leads to the life of peace that we're all longing for. Um, and I don't want you to take my words for it. I want you to take Jesus's words. So Matthew 11, 28 through 29, this is what Jesus says. It's an invitation to his disciples and it's an invitation to us today. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. Is like anybody weary? Anybody mm. burdened? Anybody yeah. tired and exhausted of just everything? Everything, <laughs> yeah. all the things, right? Yeah. So this is for you. So come to me all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I, this is Jesus. This is what Jesus says of himself, because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. What a powerful invitation that Jesus has for us to take on his lowly life, his humble life, in an exchange of yokes that actually gives us the gift of his rest, the gift of his peace. The ancient Hebrews had this idea of shalom. Uh, that's what we would translate in English of as peace. And, and shalom, the type of peace that Jesus provides with the presence of humility, it's a type of peace that um, is present in the midst of chaos and also powerfully in the absence of it. It is both internal and external. It's something that cannot be stripped from us, from the world and from the enemy himself. That's so good. I'm thinking about just how refreshing it is to be around people that are walking out humility. Like they don't act like they have it all together. Once again, like we know not everyone's perfect, but to be around people that are humble enough to like, mess up sometimes or to like laugh at themselves or to delight in their weaknesses and like their own, you know, quirky ways or or their personality, however that like displays itself. But those kind of people are so refreshing to be around because it creates an environment of like, we are all figuring this out together and we are not trying to like 
act like we're something that we're not. Yeah. You know, so I feel like not only is humility a gift for ourselves, but I think it's it's a gift to our communities as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, thanks for this teaching today, Joel. I'm so excited to get your book out into the world and for people to have it in their hands and um, for all of us to dive into even more of the gifts and benefits that that humility has taught you. So thanks for putting in the work to get it to us. One of the things I love at the end of the book, Shay, that we did is um, we wrote out almost like a daily process with daily verses of scripture to live out humility. It's almost like a devotional that's built into the back of it. And so if you're like, wait a minute, how do I actually do this? How do I actually live this out? I think that resource at the very end of the book is something very tangible and specific that's so helpful for you to actually cultivate and live this out in a daily way. I love that. If there's anyone that can help us take something as difficult as humility, something that maybe that we've been resistant to and break it down in, in a daily way. I feel like that's you. So thanks for doing that. And uh, I can't wait to pick up a copy. Thanks. Hi friend, thanks for watching this video. Proverbs 31 Ministries is a nonprofit organization and our mission is to meet you and women like you with scriptural truth and encouragement in the moment you need it most. Every day we offer free biblical resources, devotions, podcasts, videos, and more, all to help women around the world know the truth and live the truth because it changes everything. Find out more about how you can get involved today by visiting us at Proverbs31.org.